In this third part of our look at the cardiovascular system and how it responds to exercise, we'll take up a look at the electrical activity of the heart and its measurement in the form of the electrocardiogram. And then we'll look at the regulation of blood pressure in the vascular system, both at rest and during exercise. <clears throat> so there's two kinds of cells in the heart. There's the myocardium, the muscle cells that do the contract and do the work of pumping blood. And then there's the conduction system, the so-called intrinsic conduction system. And it's a, it's a family of cells that controls the kind of the pathway of depolarization as it spreads through the heart. Each uh, cell in the heart is connected electrically by gap junctions, ion channels, so that if one cell has an action potential, it spreads to all the cells of the heart and the entire heart contracts and then it relaxes. The intrinsic conduction system initiates that process. The first cells to have an action potential are cells of the so-called pacemaker or sinoatrial node. Once those cells have action potentials, they spread from sinoatrial node to the entire heart. But they do it through a prescribed pathway. The next, <clears throat> the next thing that, can, that experiences depolarization after the SA node is the atria. And from the atria, then the atrioventricular node, the AV node. And that's the gateway of electrical activity passing from the atria down into the ventricles. It's also a delay timer to allow time for blood to move uh, as the atria contract down into the ventricles. Then the depolarization spreads through the, through the AV bundle, down into the ventricles, through the bundle branches, to the left and right ventricles, and then finally into the myocardium. The Purkinje fibers deliver uh, the, the wave of depolarization into various parts of the myocardium. Here's another way of looking at it, a, a cartoon representation of the heart <coughs> showing the intrinsic conduction system in yellow. So the sinoatrial node, the SA node is the pacemaker, first action potentials, spreads through all the muscle cells of the atria and they contract, pushing blood down into the ventricles. Then the wave of depolarization hits the atrioventricular node, the AV node, delays for about a tenth of a second, sends the wave of depolarization through the AV bundle down into the ventricles. That's the only path for electrical conduction down into the ventricles. If anything happens to those cells, then there's going to be a dissociation electrically of the two parts of the heart. So anyway, then the wave of depolarization spreads through the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers initiating the actual contraction or depolarization of the myocardium, the muscle of the ventricle. <clears throat> so if we take a very sensitive voltmeter with an amplifier and place some electrodes on the body, we can, we can record an impression of those electrical events taking place as that wave of depolarization spreads through the heart over and over again for producing a very standard reproducible uh, wave form it's called. Let's, here are the names of some of the parts of the wave form uh, and what, what's going on. The P wave, the first part in, represents atrial depolarization or is produced by atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is produced during ventricular depolarization. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization and then we wait for the next beat to be initiated by the SA node. Sometimes there are abnormalities of the electrocardiogram. Those are called arrhythmias. And certain arrhythmias we'll be watching for when we do a cardiac stress test. And we'll talk more about that. So here's the, a, a, a cartoon representation of an idealized electrocardiogram. So this repeating waveform uh, includes the P wave, atrial depolarization. This flat part right here represents the delay of the wave of depolarization in the AV node, and then passage into the AV bundles, and then finally when the, when the ventricular myocardium starts to have a wave of depolarization, we see this big QRS complex. Now the whole, the whole ventricle is contracting, and it turns out the cardiomyocytes in the ventricle just keep depolarize. They stay depolarized for an extended period of time. So all during this period, this flat period right here, time on the x-axis here, uh, that the heart is contracting. First it depolarizes, then it stays depolarized and contracts in order to allow time for blood to move out into the arteries. And then finally when the ventricles repolarize, we see the T wave. 
cardiologists divide this, uh, this series of waves into segments and intervals that are used diagnostically to identify various types of problems in the heart, arrhythmias in the heart. So for example, if the PR interval becomes elongated, uh, that suggests that the AV node or the AV bundle is not passing the wave of depolarization down into the ventricles as it should, and there's an excessive delay happening there. This is a simple example. And we'll look at another type of, of um, arrhythmia involving the ST segment right here. If this flat baseline of the ST segment shifts up or down, uh, that will be a diagnostic indicator. There's another way of looking at this, a visual to go along with that discussion. Right? If the P wave is formed as the atria depolarize, there's a flat interval while we wait for the AV node right here. It's a delay to depolarize. Finally, the wave of depolarization shoots down into the ventricles and the actual myocardium depolarizes, forming the QRS complex. And then the, <clears throat> the myocardium of the ventricles remains depolarized for a significant period of time, the ST segment. And then finally, this green represents a wave of repolarization forming the T wave, and then the whole heart is back to normal, back to resting membrane potential, and we're waiting for the SA node out here to trigger the next beat, and we'll have another P wave. Well, <clears throat> one thing that we'll be talking about in this course is, and in lab, is the graded exercise stress test. In order to be sure it's safe for a client to undergo an exercise regimen that's prescribed by you, you would need to be very certain that that person was healthy enough to undergo that, that uh, level of exercise intensity or you risk uh, their health. And so the first step in enlisting a, a client in an exercise regimen or program is to get a medical history. <clears throat> and if someone has certain indicators, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, then we might say, well, they shouldn't be subjected to an exercise plan until they've had an, a, a stress test. In other words, what, how well can their heart step up and produce extra cardiac output uh, or extra blood flow to the body during exercise? <clears throat> so we're going to uh, connect the heart to an the body to an electrocardiograph and measure the electrocardiogram and the blood pressure during a graded exercise test, either on a treadmill or a cycle ergometer. The whole point of this is that um, atherosclerotic disease plaque formation inside of arteries that we all have to some degree or another um, may be very ex exacerbated in some people's hearts so that at rest they're fine as far as delivering blood to their heart, but during exercise they cannot deliver the additional blood needed to raise the, the work rate of the heart to produce more blood flow to the body. So what happens is as they go through the graded exercise test, their heart becomes starved for oxygen. That's called ischemia. Ischemia means not enough blood flow to deliver the oxygen organ needs. And when the heart becomes ischemic, the ST segment will either elevate or depress relative to the normal baseline. And sometimes the T wave will invert and point downwards when it should be pointing upwards. So here's a little graphical, again, an idealized cartoon electrocardiogram showing um, <clears throat> the ST segment here may be elevated. Right? If someone's heart becomes ischemic during the test, we'll stop the cardiac stress test if we see this phenomenon. We'll say you have advanced uh, coronary artery disease and you may need to seek intervention, or at least we'll know to prescribe a very moderate exercise regimen for them. Here's an ST segment depression, another sign of, of um, ischemic uh, heart conditions. And finally, an inverted T wave. As you can see, the T wave normally in this particular set of electrodes on the body has an upward deflection. Now it's showing a downward deflection. <clears throat> well, um, an interesting thing is that when you see the electrocardiogram, you may think that those, those, those QRS complex spikes represent the actual contraction phase of the heart, when really all they represent is the initiation in the contraction phase. Once the heart muscle cells depolarize, they remain depolarized for a considerable period of time and they continue to contract. That's what gives enough time for the ventricles to pump blood out into the arteries. And so here we see the timing of these two graphs is, is uh, accurate. 
so that on the lower graph we're looking at the electrocardiogram, the upper graph we're looking at the pressure inside the ventricles as they contract and squeeze down in the blood to push it out into the arteries. So first we have depolarization of the ventricle, and that we know because the QRS complex has been exhibited, and then we see the pressure rising in the ventricles and then remaining elevated for a considerable period of time, a couple hundred milliseconds, and then finally relaxing and the pressure drops. So the electrocardiogram is like a lightning flash, and then we have a period of time where we allow time for blood to get out of the heart as the myocardium remains contracted. And then finally, the T wave is an exhibit of the repolarization of the ventricle. Incidentally, these two little squiggles represent sounds produced by the, the valves closing. We looked at the anatomy of the heart and we saw that the heart has two atrioventricular valves which close as soon as the heart begins to, to uh, beat and that causes a sound, the first sound of, in the stethoscope that you hear when you auscultate heart sounds. And then when the heart relaxes, blood tries to come right back down from the aorta and the pulmonary artery into the back into the ventricles and the, the semilunar valves close, slap shut violently and it produces a sound, a shock wave. So that's what you're listening to when you listen to the heart with a stethoscope. You're listening to the valves closing. One, two, one, two, lup, dup, lup, dup. It's, the, it's like, think of trying to talk to somebody under the swimming pool, right? You can still hear something. It's a muffled sound, and so the slapping of the valves produces this muffled sound in the stethoscope. <clears throat> well, let's look now at the, think about the performance of the heart. <clears throat> the performance of the heart can be quantitated as the cardiac output, the number of liters per minute of blood coming out of the heart. So liters per minute, volume per unit time. How can we figure that out? Well, look at the volume for each beat, and then also the number of beats per minute, and multiply those together, and we have the total volume per minute. So that's what we do. Stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out during each beat, and the heart rate, obviously, is the frequency of those events. So cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. In order to understand the things that affect cardiac output, we should look at the things that affect heart rate. We should look at the governance of heart rate, and then we should look at the things that affect stroke volume, and we'll better understand what it is that impacts cardiac output. Of course, the cardiac output depends on the this training state, because training your body, exercising your body, also exercises your heart, and it gets in shape. It actually adapts to train exercise training just like your skeletal muscles. <clears throat> So here's a, here's a um, listing out of cardiac output under resting and exercise conditions for trained and untrained men and women. So over here is resting. This is the sort of textbook standard for resting cardiac output, 5 liters per minute. How about in a trained person? 5 liters per minute. What? The cardiac output is tailored exactly to the needs of all the tissues in the body. It doesn't change with training because it's still the amount of oxygen and blood flow that are, is needed by all the tissues of the body. However, look what happens during exercise. Then we see the trained heart coming into its own. During max exercise, the untrained male's cardiac output goes from 5 to 22 liters per minute. Untrained woman from 4.5 liters per minute to 18 liters per minute. Real with training, instead of 20 topping out at 22 liters per minute, the male cardiac output tops out at 34 liters per minute, five, let's say, seven times higher than it was at rest. Wow, pretty impressive. The female uh, heart at max exercise uh, tops out at around 24 liters per minute. So compared to 4.5, 4.4, huge increase. The point is, when we're thinking about the stress test, the heart's going to need that fold increase also in blood flow to supply enough oxygen to do this amount of extra work. It's doing work, it's lifting, right? Just like we calculate work when we talk about skeleton muscles, you can calculate the work of the myocardium by looking at the change in the volume and the pressure that's inside the heart that it has to work against. All right, <clears throat> so what affects heart rate? Let's look at that first. The parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine onto the heart and slows the heart rate. Right? On, the, on, the, on the pacemaker directly, I should say, not on the heart muscle, but on the pacemaker, it slows down the pacemaker so, less, so that less beats per minute occur. And the, and the timer takes longer, the AV node. 
The sympathetic nervous system, the exercise division, increases heart rate by speeding up the SA node and speeding up the, the depolarization through the AV node. It also increases the force of contraction of the myocardium, but right now we're just talking about heart rate. So <clears throat> at rest, as you're sitting reading this, your heart rate is being controlled by parasympathetic tone. That means that your native heart rate, if you took away the sympathetic nervous system and watched what your heart rate would be, the pacemaker would naturally pace your heart much more quickly. And so the parasympathetic nervous system is holding the heart rate down. And as you begin to exercise, we turn off the parasympathetic nervous system and let the heart rate start to rise. And we turn on the sympathetic nervous system and make it rise even more. And that's what happens during exercise. We have parasympathetic withdrawal in a gradually and then as a, at the same time sympathetic activation and the heart rate rises. <clears throat> this little cartoon diagram shows the heart, shows the pacemaker right here, SA node, AV node over here, and affecting those two nodes are parasympathetic fibers. Here we go parasympathetic fibers from the vagus nerve that slow down the heart rate, releasing acetylcholine. And here we have some sympathetic neurons releasing norepinephrine onto the, onto the SA and AB nodes, speeding up the heart rate. So that's what happens during exercise. Turn off the parasympathetic division over, you know, over as exercise rate increases and turn on the sympathetic division. There are pressure receptors. Before we go on, let's quickly take this opportunity to notice that in the carotid arteries, your carotid arteries in your neck split or fork, and at that junction, there's a spot where there's a pressure sensor. It's called a baroreceptor. It's like a barometer. It's an atmospheric pressure measuring thing. This is a, bar a barometer of blood, a barrow pressure receptor in the aortic artery, or in the carotid sinus, it's called branch point. There's also uh, aortic arch barrel receptors in your aorta. So those stretch receptors, if they stretch more, they, they uh, presume that the blood pressure has gone up and they signal to the medulla oblongata that we need to let the pressure down a little bit or vice versa. <clears throat> so this is just showing you um, what happens with increasing exercise rate from resting on up to maximum? Um, we have withdrawal of the parasympathetic nervous system, which starts letting the heart rate speed up to, more towards its native rate. And then the sympathetic nervous system continues to increase in activity and speed up the heart rate more and more until we reach approximately, for you guys, it's probably around 200 beats per minute or maybe 195 beats per minute uh, is your maximum heart rate. Um, there are certain medical conditions in which um, we're going to block the adrenergic receptors of the sympathetic nervous system so that epinephrine and norepinephrine cannot increase the heart rate. Certain arrhythmias of the heart can be best treated by using beta blockers, they're called beta adrenergic blocking drugs. That means beta 1 adrenergic receptor inhibitors. And so we're, we're going to um, stabilize the heartbeat, and that's good, but it's also going to make it harder to exercise because you will not appreciate the kind of increase in, card in heart rate and therefore cardiac output that you normally would. <clears throat> so people that are on beta blockers, you need to be aware. You cannot push them into exercise the way you would somebody who is just uh, natu all natural. Real quick, heart rate variability. Heart rate variability um, refers to the fact that if you look at an electrocardiogram of a resting heart, the timing between the QRS complexes, between the beats, varies all over the place. And that's called heart rate variability. When there's no sympathetic output, the heart rate kind of bounces around within a range. That's good and healthy. When the sympathetic nervous system comes on, then the heart rate becomes very stabilized, very systematized. And that's good for exercise, but if it happens at rest, that's a bad sign. That's an ominous sign that you're doing damage to your heart because your heart is never getting a rest. Sympathetic nervous system is always driving that SA node and driving the heartbeat. That's not good. <clears throat>
That's low heart rate variability. <clears throat> All right, how about the regulation of stroke volume? There are three things that affect the stroke volume, the amount of blood dished out by the heart at each beat. End diastolic volume, which is the amount of blood that filled up the ventricles right before the next beat, right? It's always filling during the rest period, diastole, and then it beats, and then it fills up during diastole, and then it beats. However much volume is in the ventricle right before the next beat is called end diastolic volume. It's also called preload. And finally, a second synonym is called venous return. It just means the same thing, the volume that entered the ventricle before the next beat. Um, aortic blood pressure. That's how much blood pressure is out in the aorta. Before the ventricle can open that aortic valve and push blood out, the pressure in the ventricle has to be higher than the, than the aortic pressure. Blood flows from higher pressure to lower pressure always. So if we want the blood to move from the ventricle to the aorta, the ventricle pressure must be higher than the aortic pressure, and then blood can go out. So the higher the aortic pressure that the ventricle has to exceed, the less blood it's going to manage to get out there. Higher blood pressure, higher arterial blood pressure, lower stroke volume. So people with hypertension have a hard time pumping out enough blood at each beat. Anyway, that, that aortic pressure is called afterload. And finally, by the strength of the ventricular contraction, that's called contractility, the property of the ventricle, how hard does it contract on a given beat? That's called contractility. So let's take a look at these three things separately. Okay, end diastolic volume. Critical thing to understand, and I know you do already, but I'm just reviewing with you now. The greater the, the stretch of the ventricle as it fills with blood, the more vigorous the next contraction. The greater the venous return, the more blood returns to the heart during diastole and stretches its walls in so doing, the more vigorously the heart's going to beat the next time and it's going to pump out more of that blood. So increasing venous return increases stroke volume. Increasing end diastolic volume increasing, increases stroke volume. It increases the number of cross bridges that can cycle. You stretch the heart muscle cells. It, the geometry of the, of the uh, cytoskeleton of the sarcomeres is intentionally designed so that that produces more cross bridges next time. We get a more forceful, forceful contraction. Where blood comes back to the heart, more blood gets pumped out and the heart just automatically takes care of it. It's called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart, or Frank Starling Mechanism. And here's a graphical representation of it. If we increase on the x-axis, right, the amount of blood coming back to the heart, we'll increase blood being pumped out by the heart. So we start out at a normal resting value of around 120 mils of, of end diastolic volume, and we jump that up to 200 something mils. The stroke volume will go from around 70 mils to around 110 mils. In other words, we're going to get a lot more blood pumped out each beat. The heart just pumps harder when it fills more. All right, venous return. What causes it? What affects it? <clears throat> well, one thing is venoconstriction. The veins have two-thirds of the blood volume in them. They're big, baggy containers, huge diameter pipes full of blood, and there's so many veins and they're so big around. Uh, when, when the sympathetic nervous system gets activated during exercise, it causes the veins to constrict pushing all that blood back to the heart, and that is venous return. So now, during exercise with the veins constricted down, it's the equivalent of raising the blood volume. And there's, there's going to be more venous return, greater stroke volume, greater cardiac output all the time. Skeletal muscle pump. As you rhythmically contract your muscles during exercise, those muscles wring out the blood that's in the veins inside the muscles, and every time that happens, then the muscle relaxes and the veins fill back up, and then you contract the muscle and it rings out. So exercising produces pumping blood towards the heart. Why, you may ask? Because the veins have one-way valves in them. The blood can never go backwards. The blood is always moving incrementally towards the heart. And the more you work your muscles, the more you help return that blood to the heart, increasing venous return. Finally, the respiratory pump, well, not quite finally, every time you inspire air, you draw air in by forming a vacuum in your thorax, but you also draw blood back to your chest pulling the blood from veins in different parts of your body back to the thorax, which uh, can only go again one way, and it comes right to the heart, increasing venous return. So the heavier you're breathing during exercise, the more you're helping bring blood back to the heart and helping the heart do its job, pump more blood out. Finally, if you increase the blood volume, 
it actually fits in this category. If you increase blood volume, that increases, uh, no, no, not venoconstriction, sorry. If you increase blood volume, that increases venous return. So increasing blood volume increases venous return, increases stroke volume, increases cardiac output. Oh, I did write it over here, good. So if you, as you exercise, we've already said that the hormones, ADH and aldosterone, are going to be released, and you're going to raise the blood volume up, and it's going to stay elevated as long as you exercise regularly. So <clears throat> increasing blood volume increases cardiac performance. You're going to have more venous return, stronger contractions, more stroke volume, more cardiac output. On the other hand, if you become dehydrated during exercise, your blood volume starts to go down. Venous return goes down. You have less stroke volume. You can't perform as well as your blood pressure falls. <clears throat> Here's a diagram of, again, end diastolic volume versus stroke volume, the same graph we looked at. We're about to look at the third uh, variable, contractility, the, for the native force of the ventricle. Look what happens if we add epinephrine and norepinephrine onto the heart muscle. Contractility for, refers to this. At a given preload, right, this is the preload or end diastolic volume. Normally we would have this stroke volume at this end diastolic volume. At a given preload, if you increase the contractility by adding catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, now you're going to get a, a greater stroke volume, a greater force. No change in, in end diastolic volume and yet uh, still have an increase in stroke volume. That's called an increase in contractility, the native strength of the heart. It covers this entire graph. We still see an increase in stroke volume when we increase the end diastolic volume. It's just that the whole, this whole relationship is shifted upward to a higher stroke volume range when you add epinephrine and norepinephrine. So that's called increasing contractility, increases stroke volume. So cardiac output equals cardiac or heart rate times stroke volume. And we've just talked about the things. Parasympathetic nervous system slows heart rate. Sympathetic nervous system increases it. Stroke volume is affected by venous return and diastolic volume, which increases the contract traction strength. Sympathetic output, which increases contractility, increasing contraction strength and stroke volume, and afterload, which reduces stroke volume. If arterial blood pressure goes up, stroke volume goes down. Okay, join me next time as we continue talking about the cardiovascular system and start looking into what happens during exercise to various aspects of cardiac.